So in a few of my videos, you might have noticed that I put a diode in parallel with inductive loads, like relays or motors. This video is going to explain why that's important. And make sure you've already seen my tutorials about inductors and transistors, so you know what's going on. So let's start out with a simple circuit where I have a low side end channel MOSFET switching a purely resistive load of 20 ohms. We can pretend it's a small heater or something. And let's arbitrarily use a 6 volt power supply. And we're going to be looking very carefully at this particular node in the circuit, the transistor's drain. If we use an external 7 volt source, we can switch the MOSFET on. When the MOSFET is on, there's almost zero resistance across it, which means we have a direct connection to ground, so the voltage here is almost zero volts. This gives us a complete circuit. So current flows from the 6 volt supply, through the resistor, through the transistor, and into the return current path. Now, let's apply zero volts to the gate of the MOSFET to turn it off. When the MOSFET is off, there's nearly infinite resistance across it, so it's like it's not even in the circuit at all. Since no current can flow, there won't be any voltage drop across the resistor. And since there's no voltage drop, 6 volts minus zero means that we've got 6 volts right here on the transistor's drain. And here's what that looks like on the oscilloscope. On the top, I'm switching a MOSFET with a 7 volt square wave applied to the MOSFET's gate. And on the bottom, you can see the voltage at the transistor's drain. It's a 6 volt square wave. Very simple. Now let's get rid of that resistor and make things a little more interesting. Here's the exact same circuit switching an electric motor. Uh, what the hell is happening here? If we zoom out a bit, we can see these gigantic voltage spikes reaching 40 volts. So why is this happening? Well, the motor is an inductive load, so let's model it as an inductor. When the MOSFET is on, current flows through the motor and everything is fine. Since the motor is running, now it has some stored inductive energy. And let's represent that with this energy bar. Now when we switch the transistor off, look at what happens here. Remember the golden rule of inductors. The current in an inductor cannot instantly change. So instantly after we turn off the transistor, there's still current flowing through this inductor. In fact, it's going to take a while for the current to stop flowing. But there's nowhere for this current to flow. So what happens is that the voltage will build up and up and up until all of the stored inductive energy has been turned back into electrical energy. So we get this gigantic voltage spike on the transistor's drain. Remember, the electron flow is actually backwards compared to conventional current. So when current is flowing downwards here, all the electrons are actually moving away. And with all the negative electrons leaving here, we end up with a very positive voltage spike. And if the voltage spike is high enough, it runs the risk of destroying the transistor and other things attached to this part of the circuit. I'm using an IRF Z44, which is rated for up to 60 volts. So I'm lucky the inductive spiking wasn't enough to kill it. But with a bigger motor driving a heavier load, that could easily have happened. Okay, now how do we solve this problem? Well, put a diode in parallel with the inductive load, but backwards. Now when the transistor switches off, there's actually a good path for current to flow. The inductive energy will get dumped out of the motor, through the diode, and get returned to the power source. And it will also recirculate back into the motor until it dissipates. It's a simple addition to the circuit, and look at the difference it makes. The inductive spike is completely gone. Sometimes this diode is called a reverse bias diode, anti-parallel diode, freewheeling diode, catch diode, or flyback diode. And no matter what you call it, it's just a diode that lets inductive energy take a return path somewhere safe. In this case, some of the energy is being diverted back to the power supply's capacitors, recharging them just a little bit. If the inductive load was much bigger, the returned energy might be too much for the power supply to handle, in which case you'd need to be powering your circuit from a battery that can be recharged. Oh, and when you're doing this, make sure the diode is pointing in the right direction. If you have the diode this way around, current will continuously be flowing whenever the transistor's on, and the diode will blow up. Hooray, another smelly failure. Now, as for the type of diode, I used a 1N4007, and that'll work in most situations under 1 kHz. If you're switching things at higher frequencies, you should find a fast Schottky diode, like the classic 1N5819. Anyways, that was just an example with a motor, but the exact same problem occurs with any inductive load. This includes solenoids, the primary coil of a relay, transformers in a flyback configuration, and a whole lot more. Alright, thanks for watching. Now you know how to save your circuits from inductive spiking.